Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. Our flag is being the geospatial center of the nation, of the world. Throughout the show, you're kind of witnessing this shift, this change. I found what truly makes me happy. Today on Spotlight, why geospatial intelligence professionals are meeting up in St. Louis. Plus, a group dedicated to puppets that's been around for over 80 years. And then tracking the COVID variants by testing water samples in Missouri. But first, meet the former music director for the St. Louis Symphony turned author. It's Sunday and you're watching the Emmy Award winning Spotlight. When it comes to music, Maestro Leonard Slatkin knows the score. There are only two kinds of music, good music and the other stuff. He has led orchestras all over the globe, but for almost 30 years, Slatkin was associated with the St. Louis Symphony, serving as music director from 1979 until he left to lead the National Symphony in 1996. Here in the nation's heartland, right in the middle of the country, we became an important orchestra, in particular for our promotion of the music of this country. I hated to leave, but after all that time, I would have been put into maintenance mode. And I'm not a maintenance person. I'm about trying to find new ideas. And many of those new ideas can be found in his new book, Classical Crossroads, available at Left Bank Books. His thoughts are especially timely now because of the effect of COVID on the arts. I think we are going to see a big sea change in how our audiences are. So we have to adjust programming. We have to adjust the way we present the concerts. We have to make the difference between the live event in person radically different from what you can get with all these streaming events that we've been able to see. One, two, three. As in his two previous books, Slotkin makes the complexities of music easy to understand and easy to take, thanks to his irreverent sense of humor. Which piece would you be perfectly happy never having to conduct again? 1812 Overture. I do not need to do this piece again. The Pachelbel Canon. I had to record this piece. I hate this piece. I really don't like it. Really? Yes, I can't stand I love it. it. It goes on and on doing the same thing. You know, I, I was just happy that none of my marriages had to use this as music. Maybe for divorces, it would be good. That might be nice. You are not only from Hollywood, so to speak, but not just geographically, but really of Hollywood because of your parents. Amazing. I'm a studio brat. My father was the concertmaster of the orchestra at 20th Century Fox. My mother was the first cellist at Warner Brothers, and her brother was the pianist at Warner's. So if you've seen films from about the late 30s to about 1956 from those studios, you've heard my parents. You've heard them all the time. My dad stopped playing in the studios in the late 50s, concentrating on conducting and arranging. My mom, though, continued to play for a while and was made somewhat infamous by a certain gentleman who gave her two notes to play for a film score. And those two notes went like this. And John Williams always refers to my mother as the original Jaws. When I was given the book and started to read through it, I was like, this seems like a book, just looking at the chapter headings, that maybe is written for professional musicians to read, sort of an inside baseball kind of thing. But as I started to read it, and I'm completely a dilettante when it comes to classical music, I was fascinated by it. The idea is for people who have some interest in it, what does an orchestra do? What does the conductor do? What's the relationship with the people writing the music? What restrictions do we have? And the idea was that the 20th century and the 21st century have seen a huge change in what's occurred in my part of the music industry. And I wanted to point those out so that people would really 
understand what's different, why it's different, and possible solutions for things that I think are difficult. Well, unfortunately, we're at the end. Oh. But it's not a cliche. Sincerely, thank you very much, Leonard Slatkin, for being My with us. My great pleasure to be with you. Scan the QR code on your screen with your phone's camera to watch the full interview and find out about their unique audition process and what Slatkin thinks they need to change. Or head to HECmedia.org. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. GeoFutures is building and growing jobs and opportunities here in the St. Louis region and really can kind of plant our flag as being the geospatial center of the nation, of the world. GeoFutures, an initiative of Greater St. Louis Inc., was launched in October 2019 to bolster the St. Louis region's rapidly growing geospatial sector and develop a strategic plan for the future. Its work has come as the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NGA, builds its new Western headquarters in North St. Louis, which is slated to be fully operational in 2025. GeoFutures project leader Andy Deering touches on why this is important to the St. Louis region. NGA is one piece of the component, but there are other pieces that we can connect in to say if we're going to grow talent or if we're going to create jobs, what does that look like and how do we take advantage of this opportunity that we do have here? Back in 2016, the director Robert Cardillo um, selected North St. Louis for their new next NGA West headquarters and putting in almost $2 billion of, of investment up there. It was about the location intentionally, but the opening up and being more transparent, having more engagement from the community. Community engagement is one of the five main priorities of the GeoFutures strategic roadmap, along with scaling up talent, raising innovation capacity, accelerating entrepreneurship, and branding St. Louis as a national thought leader. One element is workforce and talent. You know, there's many organizations that are popping up and working directly in with the schools right now to say, well, here's what STEM is. Here's what a career in geospatial looks like. Here's what it will look like maybe in 10 to 20 years. Are flying cars a thing? Maybe. That's kind of interesting, right? Bringing those nuggets to be able to say, I do want a career in this, and here's what I need to do to be able to do that. And one element is, is entrepreneurship, because NGA is not the only player that we have in town that actually is working in the geospatial industry. We actually have one of the largest agriculture firms here that is using the same information and data, but using it to help solve crop problems. And that would be? That would be Bayer, you know, formerly Monsanto. Mm -hmm. They invest almost as much as NGA does, but their mission is like, hey, we've got to feed the world, right? We've got to help support that. And so it's a lot of the same techniques and tools. And so just um, having the, the community understand that there's lots of opportunities that are here today, but there's going to be more opportunities in the future as we start bringing in the businesses. Greater St. Louis, Inc. has a very strong position on diversity, equity, and inclusion. How is that folding into this operation, Geo Futures? We were very intentional in, in 2019 when we were putting together the report. One, because NGA was moving into a neighborhood that, um, that was challenged, and, and there was a lot of opportunity there, but it had to be done right. And the neighborhoods had to be leading the, the development and the work with that. And so we worked closely with the neighborhoods in Project Connect. We worked closely with um, SLDC and some of the work that they were doing. If you look at our roadmap and report, there are specific metrics on diversity, equity, and inclusion built into all of that. So if we're going to build a talent initiative coming out of there to grow the talent, it's got to be diverse talent, and we've got to hold ourselves accountable to that. Let's break it down to a granular level. What is it going to do for me as an average St. Louisan? You know, in North St. Louis, there will be a campus that will be built around, you know, that will be built up there. That's guaranteed. What else is going to be built around that? And not everybody's going to be a geospatial professional. We all, we all know that. But there's going to be other things that are going to be needed up there. Say I want to be an entrepreneur and, and have a restaurant, right? Or I want to, you know, provide some sort of a service that's up there. What do those opportunities look like, and how do we be intentional about that? And all of those, that's not a core piece of what GeoFutures is going to do, but as that cluster builds and the strategy grows, that, that reverberation of what's happening will provide more greater opportunity for everyone. And so that's, that's our goal and hope of how this means. And so everybody doesn't have to be a geo person, mm -hmm. but they would definitely be impacted by the, the impact on the community. The largest gathering of geospatial intelligence professionals in the nation will be taking place in St. Louis in October. 
Visit usgif.org to learn more and get involved. Scan the QR code on your screen for the full interview or visit hecmedia.org. You just never know where that spark is going to come from. You're putting a human touch to everything through the vehicle of art. We give them the ability to hope. Hi, my name is Michelle O'Donnell, and I am part of the Puppet Guild of Greater St. Louis. The Puppet Guild of Greater St. Louis is a nonprofit, grassroots volunteer organization that was formed in 1939 here in St. Louis. It's made up of anyone that has an interest in puppets. You can be any age, any ethnicity, any gender. We welcome special needs people uh, that have an interest in puppets and we've seen a, a real growth in that in the last few years. But no matter who is a member, we all help each other and we can all learn. The mission statement of the Puppet Guild is to perpetuate the art of puppetry through several different ways. Through education, through performances, through exhibits, through meetings, through workshops, through festivals. The Guild got started, as I said, in 1939. It is chartered through a larger organization that was formed a year and a half before called the Puppeteers of America. The Puppeteers of America encouraged large cities like St. Louis, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco to all form puppet guilds. The guild was very instrumental in helping me with uh, my career in puppetry. Uh, because of um, people assisting me, mentoring me. It's also helped me with camaraderie and feeling like I have sort of a family or a place to land. Hi, uh, I'm Daniel Digger Romano. I do hand puppets and shadow puppetry uh, with Blackberry puppets. I got started in puppetry um, really through um, political protests and demonstrations. I, I found that it was reaching people in a different kind of way that uh, just talking to them or other ways didn't quite reach them. And I saw puppetry as a way to tell stories in a new way. The more I realized that it is an art form, the more effective it was for me uh, to reach audiences and express myself artistically. Hi, I'm Bob Kramer and Bob Kramer Marionettes. The Puppet Guild of St. Louis started a long time ago. And when I was in fifth grade, I have no idea how I heard about it, but um, they had the meetings once a month and I started going with the first meeting. And uh, every meeting we made a different puppet and they kept encouraging me to go on. But it became really like a club, you know, sharing ideas and sharing our joy of puppetry. I got started in puppetry um, with my wife and now puppet partner. Uh, she had a show that required two people. Uh, she asked me if I would do it and I reluctantly uh, learned the show. When I got behind the stage and actually performed it, everything just clicked for me. I found what truly makes me happy. Most people, especially in this area, think of puppetry as a, a children's entertainment, and it certainly can be that. Uh, but in other cities in this country, and certainly in Europe, it's, a, it's an art form. So one of my goals, artistic goals, is to introduce an art form that will appeal to uh, adults as well as children. Like I say, you know, almost every small town throughout Eastern Europe will have a puppet company. And we have people come here who immigrated to the United States. Oh, when I was a little girl, every week we went to see a puppet show. And I'm like, every week? <laughs> I would be dead if we had to come up with a new show every week, needless to say. But it's a wonderful part of uh, our, our culture and we need to uh, expand it and uh, to reach more people. Another goal is 
to instill the love of the arts to children, but also um, we never know if in that audience, Sarah's gonna be the next Jim Henson. So if they feel acceptance and love and think, oh, those people are really cool, we let them come backstage afterwards and show them the puppets, show them our staging, give them our card, and we encourage them to join the guild. So we just never know if that next child is going to be a future famous puppeteer. Go to hecmedia.org for the arts and authors. Completely accidental because I never set out to write a book. Science and history, culture and community. It's considered to be the oldest organic farm west of the Mississippi. Education, films. Finding the coin places the site firmly in the 13th century. What's happening now around St. Louis and more. See for yourself at hecmedia.org. Collecting samples of wastewater may seem like a dirty job, but somebody has to do it so that Dr. Mark Johnson's lab at the University of Missouri can track the spread of COVID-19 and its variants in the state. All he needs is human waste to identify genetic material from the virus. As long as you're using the toilet, then your waste is going to the wastewater treatment facility, and so we can measure it. The MU professor of molecular microbiology and immunology is a pioneer in this new science of COVID-19 tracking. I have the best sort of observation view of anyone in this country. When I see something new, it's, it's, it's very recent, and it's not just like one patient. It's like, okay, in the sewer shed, we're starting to see this thing. I mean, I, 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 I could tell Delta was, a real, was the real deal long before the CDC decided it was the real deal. Partnering with the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services and the Missouri Department of Natural Resources, Johnson's lab was first to identify the Delta variant in Missouri nearly a month before the first patient tested positive for it. First time we spotted it was on, in the sampling from May 10th. And it was noticeable because it wasn't just like sometimes when a new variant enters a uh, sewer shed, it will start off small and maybe grow. But um, it was already a good chunk of the sewer shed the very first time we saw it, which was from Branson, Missouri. And at that point in time, just to be clear, it wasn't the Delta variant then. It wasn't coined, the, the term Delta variant wasn't coined until three weeks later. And it was not a variant of concern based on the CDC. It was not labeled a variant of concern until over a month later. But it was, the World Health Organization had flagged it as being the most contagious form of the India variant. So I had been watching for it and it definitely got my attention. By testing wastewater from communities throughout Missouri, the lab then successfully tracked the spread of the Delta variant across the state. Missouri is the first to have this level of success with wastewater surveillance. Johnson says that's because his viral sequencing protocol is different. No one else is, is saying, oh, let's do it the way Missouri's doing it. They're all continuing to um, try and get the whole genome every time. And the way Johnson is doing it quickly identifies variants. We develop the techniques where what we do is we um, we look at a very small piece of the SARS-CoV-2 genome. So it's kind of like if you can't look at the whole person, but you want to be able to tell who they are, you would probably look at their face. It's, it's kind of like that. Johnson is confident he'll be the first to know when and where a new variant may emerge in Missouri. We're watching for it. I, I haven't seen anything scary new yet. Um, Delta is sort of like still the cream of the crop. It is really contagious. For more information, including wastewater testing results, you can find the full story on our website, hecmedia.org. St. Louis in watercolor, later on Spotlight. We are here at the Craft Alliance, and I'm excited to present Unearth Timekeeping Mound City. So my work is totally mixed media. I love to just combine a plethora of materials. So because I'm trying to tell a story about time, there's a lot of repetition. I use a lot of photography and news headlines, and I'm doing deep dives into historical documents. Looking at St. Louis as a whole, I go all the way back to the Mississippi and the Pennsylvanian era where there's literally just covered in sea. 
I wanted to take a look at who were the inhabitants, but not just people, looking at plants, nature. As you walk through the show, you move into the future. And I'm looking at this sort of destruction of the mounds that were incorporated all throughout. There was over 40 mounds that were here and now there's only one. So throughout the show, you're kind of witnessing this shift, this change. And as you move into the future, I'm looking at colonialism, I'm looking at slavery, I'm looking at who were the inhabitants coming forward through that time. And so I do a little bit of a deep dive into Dred Scott and how he sued for his freedom and how that history has carried forward. I do have an interest, a personal interest in not just like geology and plants, but also in, in social justice and looking at like who, who gets to live here and who gets to uh, be a part of this, this land. And so um, looking at Dred Scott kind of led me to looking at the riots that happened in 1917, looking at the riots that happened in 1949 examining racial covenants and to do that I'm looking at images of maps. As you move forward there's a piece about Mike Brown and for me it was just more like this catalyst in history. There's just all these protests, this uprising of people being like we gotta make some changes and so the last two works of the show really encompass this sort of sense of activism and I'm looking at different activists using their imagery as my material and how are they carrying forward a new energy in the city. I like to think about moving forward. How do we take the past, not ignore it, but carry it forward in a new way and create something different, something better that allows us all to be here. Not just people, but like nature and plants and everything. We're all connected. And I think that's the heart of the show is there's beauty in recognizing that every single thing is connected. I hope you can make it out to see the show. It is up till October 23rd. And for more information, just go to craftalliance.org. HEC Media, bringing you culture and community. Find all of HEC's positive programming and award-winning content at hecmedia.org. I'm showing my view of St. Louis, whereas uh, a photograph is just photographing it. I can edit and make it the way I want it. At one time, I didn't have the city building here. At one time, it used to have Bush Stadium. Bush Stadium's gone where it used to be. Um, and things have really changed. I am Marilyn Bradley. I'm an artist. I did all the illustrations for the book, St. Louis in Watercolor. Here is what I like. This is the one over at Faust Park. Marilyn Bradley has been painting for over 60 years. Her favorite subject is St. Louis. Her first published book in 2008 was all about the city's architecture. This book, St. Louis in Watercolor, Living History in the Gateway City, digs into its past and its present. This started out in St. Louis and it, the bottle itself has evolved and moved and moved from place to place. There was more than one bottle. So this one is downtown near the arch and it's one of the last left. And this all came from the World's Fair. I don't know if everybody knows that U City really began because of the World's Fair. There are over 100 paintings in the book, each with a story. Forest Park is younger than New York's Central Park, but 500 acres larger. The Boathouse Lake dates back to 1894, and we have 6,000 people to thank for digging it by hand for a dollar a day. Eat Right on Choteau Avenue has been around since 1935. The diner was renovated in 2018, but COVID closed it completely. The lamp, naturally, everybody knows that it's haunted, but you can stay overnight. I don't know if people realize it, it's a guest house. This particular building has so much history. It was next door to the Demonel house. Demonel is, goes all the way back to show the same family. So the lamps were next to it, but there has been a lot of suicides 
in the family for here, and even in this particular building. And I think that's why it's, they consider this a, a ghost house. She paints with watercolors, I paint with words. Jennifer Grote Peter is a wordsmith. She authored the stories in the book. Everyone knows St. Louis is rich in aviation history, but did you know that Charles Lindbergh actually got his start on a mail route from St. Louis to Chicago in a plane housed right here at the Historic Aircraft Restoration Museum? And you look at the aircraft behind us and you may not realize that those shiny wings are fabric. You're in a fabric airplane. The scarf is blowing, trying to keep the castor oil off of your face, and then you ingest this castor oil, and we won't go into what that does to you later, but they don't cover it in flight school. One of the stories reads like a true crime podcast. Webster Groves was founded on a homicide way back in 1896. One day, a man named Bertram got off the train from Chicago. A young teenager offered to help him with his luggage. After taking him to town, he stopped inside the local saloon to tell his friends of the well-dressed man with cash. Uh, one of the boys suggested that they rob Bertram. And one of them had access to a gun, so he went home and got his gun. And they didn't know Bertram was also armed. And he shot one of them. So they shot back, and Bertram died on the spot. At the time of the murder, Webster wasn't officially a town and had no police department. The outrage continued in the town, and they're like, we need a police department. Let's be a town. So they incorporated as a city exclusively to hire police. And the second thing they did was start taxing saloons until they taxed them all out of business. And until about 2017, 2018, somewhere around there, there were no saloons in Webster. What is now Laclede's Landing holds a lot of history. Its cobblestone streets are the only thing left from the original 1780 French settlement. As the urban legend goes, it also houses a haunted alley. Following the Great Fire of 1849, there was a cholera epidemic. People were dying in the streets. The cemeteries were full. You've got nowhere to go with those bodies. So they started stacking them up in Clay Morgan's Alley. To this day, spirits, it is said, can be seen roaming the streets of St. Louis. St. Louis has a beautiful future ahead of it, but we don't want to lose track of what we had. And I think that's what's important about the book. Marilyn tells a visual story. I give you a written story, but there's so many stories. Next week, a STEM-based workforce education company training 16 to 24-year-olds. Plus, exploring the Contemporary Art Museum's fall winter exhibits. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.